Shailis de Pais. Salis. Do you seek him? 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 Do you seek the nameless god? You have found yourself among those who roll the dark dice. What you are about to hear happened long ago. A story brought back from the edge of oblivion. Dutifully transcribed and enhanced orally to better captivate your attention. Previously, a group of adventurers on a pilgrimage arrived at the sunken bulwark and opened the door to Sorrow's Edge. Dark Dice, Shores of the Silver Thrum. Chapter 5, The Storyteller and the Pirate. The air within Sorrow's Edge was not like the sea-filled damp outside, but instead hung heavy with a different stench of slimy, sticky, musky offal. The smell rose from an array of blubbering, burning lamps pinned to the walls or left to burn on tabletops within its claustrophobically narrow space. The whole of the narrow building stretched further and further back. Without space to grow, the building had elongated like a crawling, grasping root out along the cliff face. Directly inside the door, hugging the left-hand wall, was a bar, and a glance out the windows on the other side looked straight down into the dark waters over 300 feet below. The bar sported a selection of drinks, ales, beers, gins, grogs, wines, and whiskey, the choice beverages of most sailors and pirates. A small chalkboard advertised fish, urchin, kelp, and crab in a scratched cursive sprawl, with meager prices indicating meager fare. An older human in blue robes standing behind the bar met Viviana's eyes as she entered. Greetings and fair sails. You must be from the Willow's Wake. She's, uh, she starts role-playing. Greetings and fair sails to you, too. I am here with my, uh, companions. C- come on, guys. And she goes in a little further to let everyone else through. Hi, hello. <sighs> hello. So, uh, yeah, I'll be the... I'll be the one holding the rear at the at the entrance, so like I'll be the last one in. Excuse me, my good sir, but what this happened to be Sorrel's Edge? Yes. If you're looking to stay the night, rooms are three silver. And if you're in need of a meal or a drink, you can order here when you're ready. We accept coin, but goods are also welcome for barter. Anything we don't have on the island is always better than coin. It's all right. You've plenty of time before the observance of last light ritual begins. You seem grumpy today. Do I sense a motive behind your grumpness that might be tied to quest and adventure? No. Oh, you probably have the shits. Let's go have kelp and booze. Oh, sorry. Hope you feel better soon. A vein on the head of the blue-robed man twitched in time with a subtle clenching of his jaw. Feel free to take a seat. And as, as Yare enters, his eyes immediately dart around the room looking for the most inconspicuous of corners uh, where they all could sit. Yara quickly found difficulty locating an inconspicuous corner in a room this long. The entirety of Sorrow's Edge was only 10 or 15 feet across at its widest, but easily 150 feet in length. This certainly led to an overwhelmingly claustrophobic feel, as though packed into a dark, soot-lined, narrow hall. The tables and seats of the pub, crafted from high wood scraps and barrels, stretched down the right side of the room, leaving just enough space for one person of convo size to pass by at a time. A narrow set of patchwork stairs near the entrance, which more closely resembled a ladder, led to the second floor, which, if the sign could be trusted, continued to sleeping quarters. On the far end of the room was another door that presumably passed through to the old path that would lead to the sunken temple. It was then that Vind Graveview, Nimble Remble Trout Spine Trout, and Ajay Ogun entered Sorrow's Edge behind them. Now more congested than before, Yara picked the most inconspicuous place within the establishment. A long table already occupied by three sailors, drinking and laughing in the candlelit dank of Sorrow's Edge. One of them, a man with dark curly hair dressed in a purple sailor's coat, gestured at the newcomers with interest, chuckling conspiratorially with the others. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Hello there. Hello, new strangers. 
How has been your journey here? Are you also here to make offerings to All Naldish, the sunken one? Lon, they're gonna think we're part of the cult. They're not a cult, Viviana. Sorry, my friend is sneaky and likes to whisper friendly things when we meet people. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you seem much more fun than the blue robes, so I think we'll get along just fine. But you're correct. We're here to make our offerings. But we have some time still. Have a seat, new strangers. Guys, come on, come on! Time for grass with tough studs! Thanks, Lon, but we'll pass on the spuds. We're gonna sit over there for now. Vind, Ajay, and Nimble walked further inward and approached a bard, giving her grand introduction. They had their own goals, and Lon had hers. To have a fun time. Lon sat down, then promptly stood up again to push Yara into a chair and pull Viviana to join the quickly filling table. Sit! Come! Don't make me hit you, Yara. Yara, come on, Viviana. Thank you. Come, come! You two, Combo, we must never forget about Combo. Sit down. I sit down with Lon, uh, just kind of sit there quietly. Um, I sit down, but I keep my eye on the far end where there's another door. Yeah, so I'm Lon, and these are my friends, Yara, Viviana, and Convo. Uh, <laughs> yes, I heard. I got their names while you were forcing them all to sit and relax. <laughs> but friends, I'm Harquin, second mate of the Round Nag. That's Ox, Welleth, and Zalen. The island is a tad sparse, and we've got a few hours until the big ritual, so we're, uh, well, we're drinking, having fun, sharing stories, but, uh, I figure you might need a little something, because the island is quite sparse, quite remote, you never know what you'll need. Figure we, uh, well, we happen to have some things available that, for the right price, we could maybe do without to sell, as it were, if you had an interest in buying. Really? So you came here to trade? I've got no shortage of coin if it's worth my time. Viviana could tell that the man was attempting to maintain a hushed tone while also trying to avoid the watchful eye of the blue-robed sunken brother behind the bar. I, I love the idea of them like whispering, but Lon is just so loud. It's perfect. Very Lon. Combo will try to make an insight check to see what's really going on. He speaks the appropriate pirate slang and has seen more than his fair share of adventures at sea. Convo could do so with advantage, rolling the 20 sided die twice. <laughs> God damn it, <laughs> double threes. That's quite impressive. <laughs> so, I want like meat or. Hey, this is a bar. They have to serve drinks. Where are we? The Bright Vale? The walk here probably made everyone thirsty. Let's be real. It's hydration, right? I'll buy. Marquin, those are some amazing looking cock glasses you've got there. Have one of your people retrieve around for us while we talk business. Sure. Good sales flow with good drinks in good company. Tell you what, if you can keep your voice a little quieter, I'll be more than happy to buy the first round. Deal? Oh. Thank you. You're already a bit loud there. So tell me a bit more about your friends. And I, I, I feel like this, keep your voice a little quieter, gives Yara quite the nice advantage for um, investigation because he's been around people that try to keep things on the low. Um, 17. Oh. To the keen eyes and ears of Yara, who had spent as much time on the docks as Convo had spent at sea, it was clear that these men were not merely drinking and chatting, but were in fact playing a game, their taps on the wooden table between laughter indicating how much they were gambling. Even while they were holding a conversation, the subtle movements of the sailors before them seemed to convey a code. When one of them put a hand under the table, and the other on the table, or laid it flat against the table, it indicated upping the ante. To remove all hands from the table certified a fold, Subtle looks flashed between the sailors as they realized that Yara understood their game. And ultimately, the woman known as Zaylin extended a hand to shake. A hand concealing cards that would deal him in. You in? Of course. <laughs> uh, so, what are we drinking? The list's on the wall there. I'll go for the wa- Gin. 
because all we've had on hand at sea is wine and horrible, horrible coffee we've all been lying to ourselves about, then I need something a bit stronger now. While undertable dealings developed, Vind, Ajay, and Nimble found their seats within Sorrow's Edge. Greetings and fair sales. The priest had welcomed them too late. Vind and Nimble had already sat themselves around a table. But Brother Nerat did not seem to care, not in the slightest. Ajay took a small detour before taking his seat. He had been drawn to the window. The shutters opened wide to the dark beyond. Except it wasn't dark enough to hide the drop below. Three hundred feet down, dark rocks and deeper waters crashed and swirled. Ajay imagined the fall, and his stomach dropped. Yes, uh, it is a pleasure to uh, meet you. I, uh, sorry, I did not realize I had a problem with the uh, heights, <laughs> but uh, this is quite a drop. Huh. Quite surprising coming from someone so tall. Never have guessed you'd be uncomfortable with heights. But uh, hey, greetings. It's nice to meet you. I am Ben Graveview of the Shade Elves from the Blackstone Forest. This is Nimble, and that's Alge. We're new guests here on the island. Very excited to give offerings to the Sunken One. But it's all uh, just a bit new to us, and we're hoping to learn a bit more about how it all works. So quick he is to assume control. <laughs> <laughs> well met, Sir Graveview and friends. I am Narat, a brother of the Sunken Faith. The sunken bulwark doesn't have anything in the way of entertainment or accommodations outside of this building, and we still have some time until the observance of last light. You're free to order a meal or drinks from the bar here or book lodgings above. It's three silver for the night. Oh, <laughs> that would be nice. Do people really drink? I mean, it's not dangerous that they fall? Certainly is. If they were to go outside and leap off the edge, or don't watch where they're going. Does that happen often? People going outside and leaping? Not often. Can I... do they... do I... can I tell if they're lying in any way? <laughs> they seem... That would require an insight check. Uh, oh, that's only a nine. <laughs> Brother Nirat seemingly had no reason to lie to Ajay. Okay. Good, 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 good. Terrifying. You said something about the temple later? Like, how long later is later? Uh, perhaps three, maybe four hours now. Huh. The sun should first rise, but it will not stay for long. And the observance of last light will begin just before sunset. Still quite uneasy, Ajay scanned the room to see who was present and, more importantly, who might be watching them with more than a passing interest. It was clear that most individuals on the bulwark wore the blue robes of the sunken faith. However, in this dangerous misshapen structure of wood, other occupants wore clothing that indicated them as guests, likely from the ships docked near the willow. Three sailors subconsciously reminded Ajay of untrustworthy ruffians, and he was surprised to see the other guests from the willow's wake seated with them, drinking loudly and laughing. Ajay could sense that this weary establishment had not seen violence for a long, long time. Nimble followed Ajay's appraising gaze, and in an effort to mimic Ajay's actions, he glanced from person to person, not really sure what to look for. Nimble's focus fell and remained on a smiling halfling near the middle of the room who sat atop a small, narrow barrel. Hers was a friendly face in an otherwise rough-looking crowd of seafarers. The woman held a small candle cup in her hand, using it as a mead mug, as her green eyes flickered across the crowd. She smiled when her eyes met Nimble's. Then, with a growing smile, she spoke up, her words almost seeming to carry a magic with them. Right, then. Well met, all. Some good soul get me a refill, and I'll tell you a tale about these very rocks. Hello, I'm Sam Yao, a voice actor you might know from The White Vault, Vast Horizon, The Secrets of St. Kilda, Chaker, My Time at Sandrock, and of course, The Boar Knight. And tonight, I'll be rolling the dark dice as Yue Hai. So, in front of Nimble, Vind, and RJ is a halfling woman, small in size, about three feet to be precise. Her almond-shaped eyes sparkle with a unique shade of green that seems to shift with her every movement, and they have an almost animal-like glow in the lamplight. Yue Hai has long, silky jet-black hair cascading down her back, and some playful bangs framing her face. 
as she holds up her small candle cup to graciously accept a refill from a generous patron. A glimpse of scars and scales peek out from the bandages snaking around her left arm. Around her neck, a shark tooth pendant glitters in the soft light, its shine landing on the ukulele leaning against the bar beside her. It looks well used, well played, and the fingers seem to twitch toward it. Despite her size, she holds a strong presence. Maybe it's a confident demeanor, or the hint of mischief in the green eyes. Either way, she extends the cup expectantly. I would sure buy someone my size something to drink. So please, if I have money for that, I shall absolutely buy something for you. Nimble spent five copper without a thought and returned with need. Do I have money? <laughs> <laughs> or perhaps he merely checked his pockets. Nimble, allow me, please. Uh, sit next to. Uh, what, what was your name? I'm sorry. <clears throat> Hello, my name is. Yue Hai. And yours? Yue Hai. I am uh, Vin Graveview. It's nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Uh, my, my friend Nimble here will have a seat and I'll, I'll be right back with uh, a, few more, a few more beverages. Ajay is very excited about the idea of hearing a local tale and so with a crooked smile he's going to shrink down a little bit and have a seat. Because I think he always feels a little bit awkward being so tall, especially around nimble. And now this new person who is so, so small. Uh, he'll choose a low chair, like a, like a footstool. <laughs> I'm higher than someone. <laughs> <laughs> and as Mead once again filled you a highest candle cup, the bard picked up her instrument. Deft fingers plucked the strings, and she began to spin her myth out into the inn's dark air of the selkie and the diviner show. <clears throat> so, there was, in old times, under purple skies, a selkie who felt a deep longing for what, though, she did not know. She swam the seas searching for that thing her heart most desired, but she could find nothing to fill the emptiness. Some say she was cursed, ever seeking the meaning of her previous life, her soul so despised by a gala, the fire spring, that even in reincarnation, she was not permitted peace. So the Selkie went to the sunken one, our deep queen, and asked for a blessing in the quest. And to her relief, the sunken one answered, her low whispers carrying on the current. Be warned, lost and little soul. For there is a way to find out that which you most wish to know. The waters of the deep sea swelled with a divine voice. Oh, great and deep sunken one, the selkie bowed and wept. Tell me, please, lead me there, and there I will build a temple to your name. The sunken one, shrouded in the depths, pulled back the dark and up from the ocean trench floated a glowing sea flower. I tell you, lost and little soul, the quest to find your answer is simple, but surviving with that knowledge will be difficult. Never let your emotions overwhelm you, else the sea shall too. The selkie, fearful but determined, nodded and bowed. I understand. Please, great and deep sunken one, lead me to my answer. So the sunken one let loose the flower, and the selkie followed its glowing light across seas and oceans until, in the chill waters near the frozen north, the flower drifted into a rocky sea cave. There, its light faded. The selkie searched the cave, high and low, hearing only strange hissed whispers like those of a goblin shark or the most cruel of whales. Then she approached the furthest stone wall and found a great conch shell, taller than a stalk of wheat, embedded in the cave's ancient stone. She leaned forward, and the whispers of time, dreams, and the intangible washed over her. She knew then her greatest desire, and her eyes welled with tears. She wept in that cave for hours as the tide grew and as the weak sun set, and she had forgotten to heed the sunken one's warning. 
Soon, the crashing waves and rough waters were too much even for a seafaring selkie, and she was dashed upon the rocks, her body and the knowledge of her heart's desire lost forever to the rolling seas. Ah, but a giant on the shore had seen the selkie enter the cave and knew of her bargain struck with the sunken one, as it was such a rare thing for mortals to have the sunken one's eye and aid. And so that giant held up the selkie side of the bargain, and there was built the great temple, to which we now supplicate here in the sunken bulwark. Enthused applause filled the soot-pocketed hall of Sorrow's Edge, and soon the muted den of conversation returned like the tide to the room. Nimble starts clapping, like, really loud. That, like, was one of the greatest stories that I ever heard. Like, you're, you're a master in what you do. Wow! Oh, thank you. That's really awesome. I've never heard something like that. Oh, you're kind. You're so kind with your words. Please say more. <laughs> <laughs> Patrons approached and left in step, tossing coins into Yuahai's yet again emptied cup. Uh, did we catch your name? Did you tell us your name? <gasps> you did not hear. Let me repeat myself. Yue Hai. Yue Hai. Yes, put some musicality into it. Yue Hai. <laughs> Vin finally returns, having missed the elaborate story, but comes bearing an armful of new alcohol for everybody here, uh, including his friend Ajay Nimble, and of course, our new friend Yue Hai. Here you go, everybody. Let's drink up and enjoy our new company, shall we? Cheers. Cheers. Oh, cheers. Ajay? <laughs> cheers. Cheers. <laughs> Ajay notably did not drink, but raised his cup to cheers with a weary smile. On the other side of Sorrow's Edge, one of the sailors returned with drinks for Lan, Viviana, Convo, and Yara, all of whom had paused their discussion to enjoy the bard's enchanting fable. As the tale ended, they turned to imbibe their respective poisons, save for Lon, who finished hers almost immediately before wordlessly sending the same sailor back to the bar with Silver. They returned to their conversation and their unseemly dealings. So, you mentioned you were trading something? Yes, Miss Viviana, so I was. If you have coin or something worthy of trade, we've got some wares for sale. What kind of wares are we talking about here? We got here on a boat and it's kind of a rundown piece of shit, so what you're selling's gotta be kind of small. At least, less than boat sized. <clears throat> I guess you got here on a boat too, so yeah, you know. Aye, something you can take away in your pocket for a rainy day. Something that'll take the edge off life's dark days and stormy seas. Keep your grip on fleeting sanity, or just keep you amused on the long nights ahead. We also have a few magic items. <laughs> Ooh. Ah, I see, I see, I see. Where I come from, we have magical mushrooms and the like. Mmm, magic seaweed. What are you, what are you selling? Of the magic items? <laughs> we got a couple things. For starters, we have a rope that makes climbing much easier. Self-knots. It actually pulls you up with it and will make you the envy of any deckhand. We have That's a, a boring one to start with. I was building up to the rest. Okay. Well, we've got... We've got a chime that opens locks. It's a bit loud, but it gets the job done when you... When you, perhaps, have forgotten your keys. Well, we also have noise crackers, but those need to be kept dry. However, when you light the fuse, you've got 20 seconds. Really 18 get... seconds. We cut it a bit short. <clears throat> yes, 18 seconds. We did cut a bit short. Once the fuse reaches the cartridge, it'll make hissing and popping noises and small explosions of light. After that, a small metal figure will emerge from within that makes additional noises for about a minute or so. Oh! And let's just be clear, that is not a magical device, so it can't be traced. Zaylin, why don't you get the Lady Lawn here more drinks? Mm. <clears throat> so yes, those are the items we have available. A mix, certainly. Some rather uncommon. And with the right amount of thought, they have a veritable variety of uses. 
And as per an earlier point in our discussion, we also have a few other select choice items. <laughs> Ingested items, let's say. Ingested? Like what? Ice cream? We do have one that lets you taste colors. Fuck! Say more! One will make you much stronger for a time. One will allow you to see through the veil into the world of spirits. One helps with courage, giving even the most modest traveler the will of a hero. And one to just take the edge off makes you happy. <laughs> That's my personal favorite. Mushrooms. Oh my gosh. One that makes you happy. What kind of food do you have? Well, it's... We aren't selling food. The, the blue robes, they... Uh... See through veils. Oh, sorry, sorry. See through veils. Tell me more. Yes, those stormy sails we were telling you about. Here are your drinks. <laughs> Unseen to all but Yara, who indicated with a hand that he wanted to raise the ante, the sneaky sailor kept Lon's change. Ah... A discerning customer. Have you heard of the red tincture? Oh, that's some strong stuff. Quite rare as well. I met someone who took it once and, let's just say, saw quite a few things that night. And you could as well, for just seven gold. Hmm, the red tincture. I'll be honest, you guys, these tinctures sound fake, and I think Yara is maybe getting a sales commission or something. But who knows? What do I know? I'm half drunk anyways. Ah, yeah, maybe a little more than half drunk. Lon continues to drink and drink and drink. Viviana, this chime seems to be up your alley. Why, 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 why would you say that, Convo? Well, what reasoning do you have behind that statement? You, you like, uh, you like nice things that, that have nice noises, I, I'm assuming. I don't know. Character, face, <laughs> judgment? Um, I'm actually interested in... Like, did you say that was a magical rope? Yes, a magical rope for sailors and adventurers alike. Makes climbing or tying knots very easy. It actually pulls you up as you... It ties the knots. Yes, it ties it. It ties its own knots. Yes. That's so cool. Must be a magical item. <clears throat> yeah. And what's the thing that makes you happy? Ah, oh, that one's called the powder of the high snows. High snows? <laughs> the high snows. It's a powder. Powder of the high snows. Drugs! <laughs> the high snows, yes. Hmm. Hmm, yes indeed. I guess you can say it's a little bit like ice cream. Yeah, it'll leave you feeling better than ice cream, though. <laughs> I'll buy it. How much? <laughs> Four gold. It's fake, Viviana. It's not real. It's most certainly the real deal. I reach into my purse. You know, I have a lot of gold coming from a very rich family. Four gold is nothing Kabo for... Kabo looks overly worried. Sure, to each their own, but yeah, he whispers down to Viviana. Hey. Maybe don't go telling them that you've got a lot of coin on you. Viviana, don't you want to see the merchandise first? I like the element of surprise. Also, you're like really drunk. You smell like alcohol. Uh, yes, that's what I am. I like to be drunk. It's so happy. Wow. Do you want to talk about it or anything? You, you okay there? <laughs> Yes, I just like to be drunk. You have no idea how much it sucks to be born into a kingdom that doesn't exist anymore and to carry the responsibility of failed generations to reunite your people. <laughs> Anyways, you wanna do it? Go for it, girl. Get whatever you want. Treat yourself. Kambu gestures over to the bartender and kind of gives him a very specific gesture. Uh, the no more. And then he kind of points over at Lon. Like, almost as if whispering to him, switch her to water. I put four gold on the table. I'm like, where is it? Uh, <laughs> well, that's the thing about buried treasure is no one knows where it's hidden. The sunken brother at the bar glanced over, then glanced away. A small leather pouch appeared on Viviana's lap under the table. It didn't even seem as though the sailor had moved. Harquin had tried to get into Viviana's pocket, however the DM's role was mediocre. I also threw in one more thing. A sample gift of the red tincture. If you like it, you can come see us on the round nag before launch tomorrow. 
During this transaction, Convo had seen Harquin's fumble. Having rolled a particularly good inside check, Convo spotted a literal card stashed up Harquin's sleeve. In a deft action, he pinned the man's hand to the table in a move that was not entirely friendly before taking the card from Harquin. We appreciate it, but I'll be taking this if you don't mind. <sighs> not at all. You want the card? You don't want the nice, cool, white ice cream stuff? No. You want the card? Yep. Convo, you're so weird. As Convo took a moment to examine the card, he noted that it was a small playing card. A seven of hearts. Not a particularly useful card on its own, however, as suspicious as he was of the card, Convo was oblivious to the game being played at the table. Seven of hearts. Why? Convo grabs it and puts it under his bandana, and kind of just looks at him. He doesn't say much, just kind of smirks, and then continues drinking his grog. So Viviana is looking, looking at this new pouch she has. Apparently it's really thin leather that folds up into a square. She quietly takes a peek inside looking at the high nose, whatever it's called, trying to see the consistency. It's the consistency of powder. Yes, I can see that. And she also sneaks a glance at the nail-sized tincture with the red liquid stuff inside of it. Then she puts it all in her bag. Fellas, pleasure doing business with you, Mr... What's your name again? Harquin. And likewise. Harquin. And I never got your name. Um, it's Viviana. But that's not important. What is important is what's on the other side of this room, Harquin? What's past the door? Past that door? Ah, that's just where there's door stuff. That's it? You mean like, room closet? I mean, it's, uh, it's more than just a broom closet. It's like, you know, they don't make gin here, they don't make grain here, they don't make much here at all, so people, I mean, your boat probably did it, you know, people leave stuff there. Ah. Uh. Offerings. Offerings. They load it all in there and stow it there too. This is the only building they got on this island. This is where everything is. Ah, uh, I see. I see. Everything? You guys only have a bar and a storage room? Let's be clear. We don't live here. The sunken faithful live here. Poor bastards. <clears throat> I don't live here. The priests here use it, not us. We... we're like you. We're not from here. We are part of the crew of the Round Nag. I thought we already said that. Uh, uh, round... Never mind it. Um, it's one of the other boats. Mm, I keep hearing these footsteps above us. What's upstairs? Mm, it's the end. Oh, okay, okay. It's the end. No wonder, no wonder. Some people like to sleep on solid ground every once in a while, when they're sure. I sure like to, I do, but it's a bit steep. Uh, the price, that is. Yes, the price. So upstairs, they have these long beds. Kind of feels like you're a book sleeping in a bookcase. Ugh, I hate that feeling, you know? Felt like nails waiting in the box for the final strike. But it's one of the ways the sunken faithful here make some coin on these barren rocks. <clears throat> these barren but blessed rocks. Uh, okay, well, as for real, Harkland. Uh, so, I know we all just started standing up to leave, but we're still talking, so maybe we just sit back down? As Yav is on a winning streak and is about to bet a little bit more, being a few silver ahead at the moment. Mm, sure. Ah, I still haven't finished my drink. This one feels a bit watered down, but it could just be me. So, how long have you guys, uh, has your crew been in port? Just a couple days. We're here for the last light blessing, which apparently is today, but you really can't tell with this accursed weather we're having. <sighs> we just do what the captain says. Yeah, we're kind of in for the same thing. Uh, so anything worth noticing or anything worth out here in the, uh, in-between time? Outside of, you know, wholesome drinking? Your friend there's winning at that one. <sighs> ah, let's see. <sighs> if you like rocks, there's tons of rocks. There's caves. I mean, guess that's just another type of rock, though. <laughs> they got bats. We hardly see those. Also, the priests here live in these weird little caves nearby. Boom! Is 
what I would say if I were a cannon. <laughs> Please continue. Yar was now up 18 silver, and he had raised the ante in this inconspicuous side game. So, what else is here? It's basically here, in the temple. And they serve alcohol here. Yeah, alcohol is not bad at all, it's not bad at all, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I get it. Where, where are you guys headed? <laughs> <laughs> ah, sorry, yes. <clears throat> We are a private charter, and our business is our own. We can't talk about that, especially with strangers. Not looking to get on the bad side of the captain, you know. Yeah, I get it. So these guys are pirates. Hands down, pirates. Yeah, I get it too. Now let's start, uh, continue the fun, eh? Lon also steals, not not steals, just takes another one and just continues drinking. Yara, Yara's gonna do a sleight of hand roll, trying to get it out of her hand before she empties it. Ha 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 you can try, but you can't pry it from my hands. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> so while this is happening, I'm just eyeing the other door and wondering what's behind her, if it's actually a storage room. In fact, I'll just ask my surprise drug dealer friend, cause what are friends for? Hey, if it's just a storage room, you don't think they'd mind if I, like, take a peek, right? You're so quiet, I believe, Viviana. You don't need to ask, they won't know, even notice you. Sure, you can totally go back there. It's not a holy place or anything. Yeah, we don't own this bar, but we can act like it. You can totally sneak away as long as you tell us first. <laughs> well... Because I want to cultivate an atmosphere of trust with my new friends, I'm letting you all know that I'm going to take a look at the storage room. I will be right back. Uh, you go, girl. Go uh, ahead. Yep, sure, sure. I hold a grog in one hand and a thumbs up in the other. Yara, waiting on you. New round. Three gold. Well, I'm on a roll, and I think this is where I double my money. That's expensive. Ooh. This is why we have Viviana. She has an endless, like, a uh, bottomless, like, a uh, pockets of gold, like a horn rainbow. We got her. I shush Lon and say, no, 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 shut the fuck, no. I, I have enough. Um, sure. Louis, Yara slide of hands the gold on the table on this stein of gin as he takes a sip. <laughs> Because most of our listeners aren't as enthused about high-stakes card gambling in an audio horror podcast, but some of you undoubtedly will have questions, the following minute will explain what happened behind the scenes. First, Yara acquired a persuasion roll to see how many pirates he had successfully swayed into liking him. For now. It did not surprise Yara to see that pirates were also welcome on the sunken bulwark. However, he was not particularly proficient in the card game, so he would not make his gambling rolls with a proficiency modifier. Yet Yara was also literate so he would not play at a disadvantage, either. He could add his charisma modifier, as there was some element of bluffing involved, just not in a way that Yara was used to. Well, that's 15. Yara gave it his all, and over the course of the lightless afternoon, he won and lost coins that unfortunately concluded with him having roughly ten silver less than when he started. Rats. And he quickly turns around to find that Av is not in earshot, and he relaxes a little, even though he just lost some money. However, he opened up many social opportunities by demonstrating to the pirates that he was on the level. Only Convo, oblivious to the game until it was too late, was aware that there were extra cards at the table, hidden under belts or behind sleeves, and while he could have pieced together that Yara had been cheated, he was a bit too distracted by Lan's drunken antics. Uh... About Lan and her drinking, did I... Was I able to sneak that out of her hand beforehand? Mm, nah, I'm just keep on drinking. I can drink like a sailor. Lan has a special ability where she can drink with the best of them. So even if you take something out of one hand, the other hand is still drinking. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah, so it's okay. There's a funnel going right into her mouth. I see. <laughs> yes, an invisible funnel. Yes. I look at Lon and I sometimes question who's more the sailor, she or I. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And she appreciates that. Uh. <laughs> Meanwhile, a few tables over, Ajay and his companions continued their conversation with the talented bard, Yuhai. Yuhai, 
I wanted to say it is a great and honorable tradition that you have telling these stories. Where I come from, it is a, considered a vital role within the community. And the way that you told the story was beautiful, powerful, and very evocative. I wanted to thank you for sharing it with us. Thank you for your kind words. It would be kinder if I was thanked in coins. Ah. And I <laughs> hold up my candle cup, which is now empty, and like, hmm? Yes. I do not know if I have any, uh, I think uh, Ajay will go into his cloak. Here, allow me, Ajay. And I throw a gold coin. <gasps> what a gentleman, thank you. I, uh, perhaps next time I will come armed with um, some of these strange metal trinkets. And might I ask you, what's, what, what are you doing here? Were you born here? Do you live here? Do you have family here? Um, well, I've been here for around a week. Um, I have my personal interesting reasons of why I'm here. But I'm eager to know more about you three. You seem like an interesting trio. Why are the three of you here? This is not uh, particularly a nice place for a holiday. Vin notices how she avoided Nimble's question and gets the impression that she might be trying to make coin, not friends. So he's a bit cautious as he proceeds. So, um, <laughs> I'm sorry. C can you pronounce your name one more time? I, I, I haven't heard it before. Yue Hai. Yue Hai. Yes. What a beautiful name. Thank you. Uh, do you have any friends, family, or, or villagers that may be expecting you home at any point? Uh, a week is a long time to be away from home. Do perhaps, uh, is there anybody expecting you um, back at a certain point? And if so, what brings you here for so long? Wow, it seems like you have dodged my question as well, but I will answer yours. No, there is no one expecting me home anywhere anytime soon. Hmm. Well, thank you. I appreciate your transparency. Oh, well, I'm not going to speak for my friends, but we all have our personal reasons to, to be here, you know. For, uh, well, for example, I come from a small village and we got flooded. That was kind of a disaster and there was a fire and some more bad weather and stuff. I believe that some, well, for some reason, the storm and sea and fire beings got angry. Honestly, we don't know if it's with us, if it's with something on where we live. But anyway, I'm kind of traveling so I can make some offerings to these nature beings on some temples, uh, which some call gods, so my village can lessen their anger towards us. I mean, we really need to eat and hunt and fish for food, and it's not currently where we can, uh, we are really just not living our best life right now in my village, and that's why I'm here. That is not entirely different from the reason that I am also here. My people were afflicted by the same problems. And as all our people are neighbors within the greater forest, the three of us were here to aid our communities. Otherwise, I would not usually come to somewhere like, well, like you said, to somewhere else different it was all quite unexpected and if i'm being honest i'm also hoping to maybe secure trade for food or supplies anything that can help our villages after all we've been through each of our communities were deeply affected by these tragedies the flood and fires yes but also a famine and the early onset of winter it's been a string of misfortune one disaster after another quite frankly and as the leader... Of your people? Um, yes. Yes, of my people. The Shade Elves of the Blackstone Forest. There were 270 of us when I took up the mantle as leader, but only 243 of us survived the fire. Now they are all relying on me to appease the gods and come back with supplies for the winter. Um, so, <laughs> Yulhai, you've been here a week. Have you noticed anything interesting? Any places that might be worth exploring while we have a few hours? Well, if you're here to give offerings to the Sunken One, then you're probably only interested in the Tide Altar. There is little else here in the bulwark. Vin takes a second, realizes that's exactly where he'd like to go, uh, without 
overcasting his enthusiasm, he collects his emotions and replies with, "Might you be able to point me in the direction?" Yue Hai looks around in a playful manner. Well, there are two doors here. This one, where you came in from, which leads to the docks, and that one on the far end.、Mm-hmm. So, if it's not the door you came in from, then that's the way to the sunken temple. That one. <laughs> Perfect. At that very moment, the distant door creaked open on orange-stained hinges as Viviana crept through. She had briefly revealed a long storeroom similar in size and construction to the other half of Sorrow's Edge. Viviana, hoping to discover a mystery, adventure, or at least a reprieve from boredom, made a swift appraisal of the room. To her disappointment, the pirate had been telling the truth. This room was clearly where the sunken faithful stored offerings and supplies in barrels and crates stacked along its walls. On a platform above, a large wooden wheel operated the crane, which lowered and raised the net and hook, which only recently had removed supplies and Fluffy the owl bear. From the willow's wake, an eight-foot-long corridor on the left side of the room remained free of boxes to allow for the careful passage of goods and people. These wooden offerings were marked with curious symbols, swirls and simple stripes indicating to sailors and priests alike that these alms contained pickled vegetables and fish, fermented and alcoholic drinks, vinegars and oils, root vegetables, cheeses, and more. To Viviana Bloodchamber, this room looked like a variable boon of simple, boring supplies. But upon deeper introspection, Viviana pondered that if the weather were to isolate the island for an entire season, one couldn't be sure how long the food would last, or how many priests residing on the island would survive. Oh wow! It really is just a storage room. Is there anything else of interest? Viviana will look closer for anything out of place or potentially interesting. With that roll, Viviana walked through the room, recognizing a familiar, permeating stench. At the far end of the room, Viviana spotted yet another door, an exit, and on the left side of the wall was a set of narrow stairs leading up to a hatch. This hatch was secured with the only lock she'd seen on the island. The young dwarven priest sat near the base of the stairs, occupied with deconstructing crates and barrels into usable construction materials. Or perhaps firewood. The young man wore the blue robes indicative of his faith, and fussed quietly as he toiled with a crate and crowbar. He was pale, with a red beard that almost resembled a nest of hay. Hi there.、Ah, hello. Wow, you're sneaky.、Uh, did you need something? We're always happy to help those who visit our sunken temple. The sunken temple? Where is that? Oh, um. If you go through this door and follow the path, you'll find your way to the tideway, and that brings you out to the sunken temple. If you go alone, you'll want to walk a bit slowly because it can be slippery, but it will be easier when all of us depart later for the、uh, observance of last light ritual. Last light ritual? Surely that's why you're here. Yes, you won't want to miss it. It happens just once a year, and today is that day. So what do you? What do you do every year? You don't like sacrifice people, do you? Because that's pretty fucking cool, but. Not about that. <laughs> we don't sacrifice people. Sometimes we sacrifice idols or or things that are brought to the island that are not found here. But it's never people. <laughs> a lot of times, people just bring their own things to offer up to the sunken one, something that means a lot to them, in hopes that all Neldeach, the sunken one, will bless them, or at least not direct her wrath their way. Your god gets angry with people. <laughs> well, she is a god. <laughs> And I suspect the selfish prayers of mortals must get bothersome with time. Many choose to instead pray to her divine saints, like Maro the Kelpant or Lenrith the Forlorn, so that their messages are delivered more safely. However, today's ritual is one of the few where outsiders are encouraged to pray to All Neldeach directly. Wow, that sounds really fun. Do you mind if my friends and I tag along? Everyone who has made the journey here is welcome to the Tide Altar to give, to pray, and to share in the observance of Last Light. Observance of Last Light. She scribbles it down on her notebook. Okay, hold on. I gotta tell my friends about this. Um, what's your name? I am Brother Skandar, and you are Viviana. Well, Viviana, 
Welcome to the Sunken Bulwark. Feel free to ask more questions if you have any. My fellow brothers or sisters on the island would be more than happy to help you as well. Okay, Skandar, I will be right back. Um, she leaves and heads back to the table, plops down, and goes, Guys. Whoa. Whoa. Guys. Whoa, what? What about it? Yeah, what's up? Is there a ball? Is there a what? party coming up? What? A ball? No, Lon. Lon, I'm worried about you, but no, so... I met this priest in that other room. His name was Scard or Scard and Scard or Scar something. And apparently all of these religious homies go to observance of last light at some temple on this island. And I think we should go. Agreed. Thank you, Lon. Are we bring Harquin? We'll be there. Our captain's orders. Oh, good. Anyone else? Well, it's... It, I mean... We were literally told by the captain to be there, and you mentioned earlier that you specifically came here for the ritual, so... Sure? <sighs> Feel like a goddamn cat shepherd. This is so exciting. I've never seen an actual ritual, like this atmospheric, creepy sort of ritual in real life before. I was kind of What do you mean, creepy? I thought it was kind of minimalist, rustic chic. Wait a minute. Are they, like, gonna sacrifice a goat or something? I thought this was, a, this was a light ritual. I thought, I mean, it would've been really cool if they sacrificed a human or something. But no, they're just sacrificing random objects or whatever. Maybe I can sacrifice something, too. Oh, maybe we can all sacrifice something. Oh, good! Yes, that'll be awesome, that'll be awesome. I'm so glad that you'll do that with me. Cool, cool, cool. So, I might not be totally um, sober right now, but I'm in like a really good mood right now. So happy, so... Uh, uh, okay, let's go. Let's go. Uh, oh, no. I think I got turned around. Which way do we go to get there? So, you see that door? Where your friend went. Yeah. That leads to the storage room, and just past that is a path outside that, uh -huh. that takes you to the sunken temple. Hold that thought. I'm gonna run to the outhouse real quick. Sure. Ah, and you're all going to the sunken temple too. Yes. So what are you gonna sacrifice, can I ask? You can ask, but it's a rather personal question. I don't have anything personal to sacrifice. I'm just here because the captain's had to be there. Just because Zaylin here lacks faith in the Sunken One doesn't mean the rest of us are heathens. Oh, so what is your captain going to sacrifice? Can I ask? What's your captain gonna sacrifice? Oh, he... He, um, you know... I think he brought an owlbear, which is like really cool and fluffy, but really stinky. Like, I didn't want to go below deck at all because it was so stinky. Hey now, she can't help it. It's how she smells. I know, but you know your captain could have like, you know, bathed her in lavender water or like jasmine water or something. You know there's stuff that you can do to take steps into improving the quality of your ship's smell. <laughs> like. Like, I have a perfume vial, and if I can make my cabin smell good, there's no excuse to not make the rest of the boat smell good, too. I'm just saying. Uh, oh. Oh. God. I have hiccups. Trinity. Uh. Well, Lon, if you let me borrow your perfume bottle, I'll make sure to lather her up next time. Oh. Shit. Well, if we ever see her again, I guess. Not going to happen. Oh. No hiccups. False alarm. So, yeah, was uh, what's your captain gonna sacrifice? Come on. Come on. Tell me. Tell me. Come on, come on. Give me the deeds. All right. We, we really shouldn't tell you this, but, uh... <laughs> Harquin leaned in. Lon could see the light of oil lamps trying to reflect off his yellow grin. He seemed to ponder if he would let their secrets be shared while the gleam in his eye gave away his mischievous willingness. Lon knew the look of a braggart. So we were trying to figure out, okay, what would, what would the great Neldich want, right? So water, 
She's got a lot of that. But what's something that she doesn't see all that often in her depths? Something that's, uh, something that can fly. Something that spends its life on land. Something from a forest, maybe that would be good. Because that's not something Neldich has. So our captain said, what else does Neldich not have? And we start thinking to it about it and got something that has all these things. Something that flies. Something that lives in a forest. Something that walks on the earth. And something really young. Because Neldich is old, right? Neldich is super old. Yes. Yes, she is. <laughs> I might not say that so close to her temple. Oh, because she's a god. So, we got her a baby Pegasus. No I shit. I can't believe that we got our hands on one. Uh, huh? That's... Whoa. She's gonna love it. Right? It's gonna be great. It's gonna be great. Our blessing's gonna be worth more. A lot more than everyone else's. God's value of surprises more than anything. Uh, I hear Pegasus are as rare as unicorns. Yeah, they are. They're really tough to find, and baby ones even tougher. We, uh... Mamas don't like it when you take their babies. But we got our ways. I mean, are, are you sure she's not chasing you down? Those things fly over water. Yeah. I mean those maternal instincts. They'll haunt you until... We'll be fine. Just a few hours to go. And no one, not even a Pegasus, would try to steal from Neldich. While apprehensive at the idea of sacrificing a baby Pegasus, or really a baby anything, Yara still has other misgivings about the island. As that whole conversation is happening, Yara is going to use his thief's cant, or rather a subtle sign language version, uh, to weave in hidden information, openly letting the pirates know that he understands very well, and trying to ask them if there's something else they're aware of happening on this island. If there's anything not necessarily dangerous, but something else going on? Harquin flashed a quick sign, telling him to wait a bit. And when he was done speaking with Lon, to Yara's surprise, Harquin flashed another grin and simply spoke his response aloud. As far as other things in the island besides the temple, the bar... The caves the priests live in. Hmm. There is a treasury upstairs. They keep some of their more important things locked away. Like scrolls? Books? Or scriptures? Whatever people give them, I suppose. Ah. Oh. You got to see it, Harkwin. Isn't it just musk books? Oh. Well, there are records for sure. I think most of the priests can read. And I saw a lot of paper there when we were dropping off our catch. Oh, interesting. I don't think we want papers, though. We want gold, right? Gold. But there's valuable stuff, too, like statues and art. Yeah, is, is trying to think of ways to convince Lan that this is not what they're here for. We're not here for gold? Um, but he falls short of an answer. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care. I'm just here for the ride. Drink up, drink up. Lon. What? Lan, now that you mention you're here for the ride, you're... What are you doing here? I mean, what brings you on this journey? We've not been, what, five days together and I haven't got to know you at all. Cheers, by the way. Yes, cheers, 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 everybody. And I'm back. Ah, new friends. To new friends. Yeah, to new friends. Pro. Cheers. Ah. <coughs> This tastes like shit. Well, everybody, I feel like I can tell you. So let me tell you my story. My name is Cho Lan. I am the sister of Cho Gui and a daughter of Dalaria. I, my family was very well off in Dalaria before the Dark Miracle devastated it. The Dark Miracle? Yes, that was the terrible day, dates, when the enemy of light, curse her name, darkened our lands, literally and figuratively. Reality physically tore apart, creatures spilled in from the world of nightmares across our kingdom, as monsters rose from the deaths below the earth, and the dead rose to new unlife. 
My ancestors fought against their file number, valley, valiantly, but there was no way to win. Everything froze. Our plants died. Food dwindled, and we were forced to flee. <sighs> we survived in other lands since then, and right now, I am on a very important mission. While my brother is fighting in the mountains, I'm on a mission to find people, people of like minds, to join him and fight back, overpower our invaders, break the curse of darkness, and reclaim what's ours. <sighs> Sorry, this really, really sucks, and I just need to like. <sighs> I need to calm down. It's okay. Just breathe. And maybe stop drinking so much. Viviana puts a hand on Lan's drinking hand. Lan grabs the bottle with her other hand and takes a sip. <sighs> so, I'm meeting with Xu Hui, my brother's friend in Winterborg, because he has many loyal Dalarian nationalists willing to join us when they hear that Silicon, Lord of Light, is on our side again. Uh? Now, you see, I have something. Something that will reunite our people. And before you ask, no, it's not something worth stealing to anyone. When they see it, though, they will have to join us. We will bring an end to this. This, this dark. <sighs> but if I'm being completely honest, I haven't really ever fought with an army before. So I think, and I think, Looking for more people of like minds with more skill in the area would be really helpful. So, so when you're saying like-minded people, are you saying you're trying to recruit an army? Or are you trying to get resources? What, 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 what are you looking for uh, uh, on this journey? <laughs> Aside from meeting with Xu Hui, anything, anything that will help. Fucking Nellian's high speaker made it illegal for my people to live in Overnesco, uh, Eastwood. So I'm trying to call out my, to my scattered people or anybody willing to fight for a true home. We're gonna, gonna welcome all walks of life. Orcs, elves, tieflings, all religions, whatever. We do not like, we do not look down on any kind of people. We value equality, we value freedom, and we just want everybody to live, to get behind a common cause and slay some god's damn vampires. And once that's done and I break the curse of the Dark Lands with the artifact, we will offer a space to live together, to join together like a com like a kind of I promise you we're not a cult. We will not dress in white robes like you know, like blue robes. Not that there's anything wrong with wearing matching robes, but you know, like, like Viviana said, like, that's not true. That's not true at all. It's not a call. It, we're a cause. We're not a cult. But I just, I want to say, to be honest, as a Dalarian, I, we've dealt with the undead for so long and being homeless for so long, like, that's why I see your gory battle stuff with the shark things the other day and that doesn't even bother me, not at all, not really. Because I've been seeing death for as long as I can remember. Right now, I just need to find Hui, <laughs> who's single and actually quite cute. <clears throat> but, um, find him and reunite my people and return home to my brother who's doing the best he can. So, yeah. So, uh, Lon. Tell you what, after this trip, you're going back to the Darklands to meet you with your brother, correct? I need to reach Venop Winterport. I need to reach Winterport, just like you guys. That's why I'm on this trip. But then, yeah, then I'm going home. You know, funny enough, I've actually been planning to travel to the Darklands myself. If you're going and you're looking for company, someone who might have your back, I might be interested in pairing up with you on your journey. <gasps> I'm so glad to hear that. I have my first recruit. Hooray, everybody. Drink up. Whoa, drink whoa, up, whoa. Drink I up. am not a recruit. Let's just go with traveling companions for now. Lon recovered five stress as Convo's red face became visible to all present. I was going to whisper to Yad. Convo's definitely getting inducted into a cult. Yep. 
Yarvay's gonna want to join too. Sooner or later. <laughs> At the bar, Nimble Rimble Troutspine Trout purchased more drinks for his fellows and had sparked a conversation with the bartender, Brother Nirat. Hi! Hey! Down here! Excuse me, Mr. Um, <coughs> sorry, Brother Nirat. Uh, hey, come closer. That cute young lady, you and I told us something about going to the tight altar to make offerings to the sunken one, and I was wondering if that has anything to do with the observance of last light you told us about, and if there's anywhere else worth checking out before that all gets started. It does. And for visitors such as yourself, Sorrow's Edge and the Sunken Temple are the only places to see. The Grand Sunken Temple contains the Tide Altar, the most sacred place on the bulwark, where all may give offerings to the Sunken One. The ceremony will take place there in just a few hours. You are, of course, welcome to visit the temple at any time to pray or reflect. It has no doors, save for the tides themselves, and it is open to visitors and faithful alike. There are numerous shrines to saints, relics, and a collection of salvage from shipwrecks. It's cold, though, so I suspect your friends would rather stay here until the ritual. Well, in that case, do you think it would be okay if I booked a few beds for me and my friends? I understand that the Willow's Wake will be docked overnight, and it's three silver per bed per night. Ah, sure. So, in that case, I'll take four beds, please. And I believe it well, three silvers per bed, and we're four, so... Uh, so sorry, I'm not good at math. We'll discover it. Uh, yes, that'll do, friend. Here's a round of drinks on the house. That comes with the room. Wow, thank you, Mr. Brother Nerat. <laughs> this place has an amazing service, thank you. Sorry if I'm being rude, I know that I don't fully follow your religion, but I'm grateful that you're taking the time to explain all of this. You have really different traditions from where I come from. For example, in my village, we give offering to these beings you call gods, and we respect them and all, but it's really great to meet folks who know more about them. How did they say again? Devout head like you and such. So, thank you. Having traveled so far, I'm sure that your prayers will be heard. Now, I have a quick question, and maybe this is really not a normal thing, but do you have anything that maybe I, 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 I could give to my sister from here? Like, I'm gathering trinkets, mementos, and stuff, so I can bring home to my village, so I can... I can't, I couldn't possibly bring my sister to here, so I... Do you have something from here that I could maybe get and give her? We have never seen folks like you in the blue robes, I mean, in our village. We do not have many possessions here, and we do not sell or make trinkets. Well, okay. Artists are known to take a small black rock from near the docks when they leave, but those are the sorts of stones you can find almost anywhere on the coast, so... Hmm. I suspect it wouldn't be of much interest to your sister. So... The best thing that you can bring home is certainly a memory or a blessing. Sir, do you see that woman over there who just walked in? The old elf lady? <laughs> Don't let her hear you say that, but yes. Oh, sorry? That's Sister Prina, and she can help you, surely. She's our, um... She's a fortune teller, a very devout, sunken faithful. And a reading with her is one you'll likely remember for the rest of your life. I also suggest that you offer something up to the Tide Altar during the ritual. And maybe then, you'll bring a blessing home with you. Oh, I'm actually here to give something. So, uh, this vial of water from my village, well, my village river, to the sunken one today. We have clear glass-like water. It's so beautiful and always still living in summer heat, so it's great when, you know, when it's really heat and people are sweating and sorry I'm talking too much again. It is what we leave from, this water, and I think it's probably not something that she gets to enjoy very often. So, hopefully she likes it and remembers that she likes my village as well. That's... that's admirable. Keep this way, friend. Oh, thank you, Brother Nerat. And I go back to... with my friends. 
Meanwhile, deeper into Sorrow's edge, Yara counted his losses in the hidden game of cards. <laughs> Between having this drunk person to take care of and having just been told that one of his potential friends is going to be inducted in a cold, um, Yara, he's just gonna shake his hand and he's gonna take another sip of the gin. All right, so uh, are we going, everybody? Are we, uh, are we doing this? Well, let's, let's see about this other cult first. What's the time? What's the time? What? Don't we have to, like, observe the time to see the observance of the last light? You, you still have some time. I'll let you know when it's time to leave if you're still here. Thank you, dear priest. So, observance of last light ritual. I'm excited. Like, what are you going to sacrifice? Something from your grandma, you said? Sad. I have some options. Options? Yeah, I was thinking, uh, maybe Sealy? <laughs> I, okay, Viviana laughs really loud and says, I'm just joking, I'm just joking. I would never, I would never kill your owl, dude. That's, that's messed up. This is, this is clearly a joke that crossed the line for Yara. I, I quickly grabbed his shoulder and I said, he, she didn't mean that, man. She, it was a joke. It was a bad joke, but she didn't mean it. I think Silly's gonna make you the sacrifice. <laughs> There's another deep, long sip of gin. Speaking of Silly, where is, where is your little bird friend? Well, if she isn't being sacrificed, she's usually about stretching her wings, being hauled up on a ship this whole time and not necessarily being able to keep up with it at full speed. Um, this is the only time she gets to stretch her wings. She'll she'll be back. I see. Oh, Convo, you're gonna like this information. While I was in the storage room, guess what I saw? What, what did you say? A hatch. No, you you do like hatches. I do. <laughs> well, you know how much I love hatches, man. I mean, sorry, orc. You you can call me hey you for all you want, for all I care, man. <laughs> it was locked, so I'm not sure what's in it. But that was all that was in that room. And some food, and... Um, am I forgetting something? Oh my god. Viviana has a look of realization. They said they were gonna sacrifice... something. They're gonna sacrifice Fluffy? No, just the baby Pegasus. Oh, okay. He, wait, what? That's fucking evil! Says the woman sacrificing the owl bear. Yeah, that baby Pegasus is our sacrifice, not yours. If you brought an oil and bear, you gotta use the oil and bear. I swear I smelled Fluffy in that room! Guys, we need to save Fluffy! Our Fluffy or their Fluffy? Our Fluffy. But I don't think the captain's gonna be too happy not having sacrifice. So we might have to come up with an alternate sacrifice, and kinda fast. I'm so confused. It's like everyone's in a cult and not in a cult and sacrificing things. I work for the company. I am just the representative. I'm just here to make sure our ship doesn't sink. I'm just a freedom fighter. I'm not a cult. Oh, sure, you're not a cult. Okay, Lon. Um, I, I pat her on the shoulder. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, totally. Um, Hawkwind, as you, as you can see, my friend over here is, is very upset um, all of a sudden. Could we maybe strike a deal where he's gonna rummage through his backpack for coins while he's saying this so that that thing that loud thing you were talking about uh, could I could I convince you to show that to Lady Viviana maybe it would take her mind off things I believe it's way too loud in here but perhaps you could show that to her just outside um, as I go and look for the outhouse really quick because suddenly I have to go as well. Sure. Um, would you mind following me, Viviana? I look desolate, thinking that Fluffy's going to die, and I drag my feet, and I reluctantly follow. As that happens, I give her a pat on the back and say, it's okay. We all lose things from time to time. People too. But don't worry. You still got some of us. And as I'm behind her, I glare at the sailors and go with her. Hey, Yare! Where are you going? Um... Yare, you said you needed to go to the outhouse? I thought it was that way. I... That's for the ladies, I believe. Oh, he's going to the outhouse. 
Then I'm gonna go out for Vienna. This is much more interesting. The bartender furrowed his brow while casting a sneer towards the group, who had now yelled the word outhouse several times, interrupting the many other conversations and events held throughout the establishment. And as Viviana, Lan, and Convo followed Harquin out the front door, Yara sauntered toward the storage hall of Sara's Edge, hoping that his goal, or at least his next step, waited within. Yara had slowly opened the door to the storage room at the far end of Sara's Edge. He had easily spotted the staircase and locked hatch Viviana had mentioned. Yara had previously represented himself as a mere shipwright, but he now moved in a way that would have looked unnatural to those who had taken the recent journey with him from Embergrad. His posture resembled a slinking cat, the small but deft movements reminiscent of a professional pickpocket or thief. These skills, Yara's less proud talents, had been honed on the docks and seedy underbelly of the sea. Growing up alone after his family mysteriously vanished, such talents were born of necessity not honor. He was no killer, nor did he consider himself a professional criminal, but rather an intruder with justified purpose, hoping that his talents could bring him closer to his lost family, or at worst, bring him to answers to what kept him awake at night, the memory of those ghostly wisps of light. Those lights plagued him, even as Yare crept towards the sunken brother who sat in his way. The young priest was still crouched beneath the stairs, pulling apart crates and barrels with crowbar. Yare had hoped to pass by unseen, but despite his best efforts, the passage was narrow and there was no escaping the young dwarf's line of sight. They locked eyes, and it was clear that the dwarf did not seem surprised to find Yara standing there before him. The priest merely nodded before returning to his work removing nails from wood and placing all the broken down components into piles based on their future utility. So Yara is, he's going to do his thing where he's saying, uh, sorry, I was, I was really looking for the outhouse. Um, the bartender said it was going to be back here. And all the while checking out that lock, seeing if his particular set of skills might help him with that. Uh, once a certain noise goes off outside. Yare politely smiled, a practiced smile that even he was unsure was genuine. Perhaps it was part of the role which he now transitioned into so seamlessly. With a quick glance and a high pass of perception, Yare noted the mark of the sunken one Neldich branded on the wood of the hatch. The hatch was secured by an average iron lock, spotted with blemishes of sea air, rust, and the nicks of regular use. Child's play. The door behind Yara rattled before opening. This way, please, sister. Ah, oh, thank you. A young priest in blue robes escorted an older elven priestess through, offering his arm as a walking aid as they moved across the groaning and uneven floor. The young dwarf, seated near the stairs, jumped to stand and stood expectantly near the exit door, dusting himself off. And seeing this, seeing that the dwarf is no longer near the stairs and is distracted from his view of the locked hatch, Yara's going to do his best to get out of the way of the older priestess, seeing as it's a narrow passage and all, and do his best to blend in with the shadows. He'll quickly climb up the side of the stairs to the hatch, with a thirteen... <laughs> Well, maybe not so good. And then Yara's gonna pull the pins from his hair, which are actually part of a lockpick set, doing his best to open the lock with a... <laughs> oh, that's a nine. Given his work on the docks and the many poorly secured chests he'd previously unsealed, but not pilfered, Yara was familiar with this exact kind of lock. Cheap as it was, he was able to roll with advantage. Okay. Come on, more than a nine. Ooh, 18. Going to take that. 22. Come on, come on. The lock come quietly on. popped open in time with a loud crash yes. audible in the other room. The DMs were either very generous or else luring him toward a far worse fate. Regardless, by the time the young dwarf closed the door behind the old priestess and her attendant, Yara was nowhere to be seen. The lock back in place through a small trick he'd picked up over the years. 
Yara found himself in a dark and narrow room, claustrophobically so. Even as he took his first steps to enter, it became clear that the ancient ship wood beneath his feet would groan with his every step. He would need to be careful, as he had already made missteps. Oh boy. I have everything I need to make some light in that very dark space. Yara took his time, each action deliberated as he quietly pulled a hooded lantern and matches from his backpack. The sparking light illuminated the space more narrow and cramped than expected, but also more enticing. A treasury. A few minutes before, Nimble did his best to carry his partner's many drinks back to their table. Seeing that Nimble was overburdened with spirits, Ajay moved to assist him. Uh, a little help. Let me take some of those for you. <sighs> Thanks, Ajay. Sure thing. But, um, Nimble, it is, um, this divine or shell cave. It is, I have heard of it before. Before our friend Yuhai told us of it. And truth be told, it is something of a personal, um, interest to me. I was wondering if perhaps it was somewhere you would be interested in going. If it truly exists, it is supposed to tell you your innermost desire and, well, our people are always on our minds, so it would make sense. It might point us in the right direction. No? Well, yeah, sure. I was just speaking with Brother Narada, actually, and he told me something that, well, that of priestess over there, that sister Prina, she is kind of a fortune teller too, and that we've got maybe a few hours until the observance of last light, and that we'll be welcomed when it starts. But like, yeah, if we have time, sure, it would be awesome going there with you and Vint. And, you know, maybe the nice bard lady too, and... Oh, oh also, I got us beds in the inn for the night. Four beds. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Do you know this, Sister Prina? Because I, for one, would... Welcome seeing an actual fortune teller at work firsthand. Assuming, of course, that she is not some common charlatan. Which I assure you I am not, Ajay Ogan. So I point the direction of the woman who just spoke. Yep, this is her. Ajay kind of creaks his neck before trying to salvage this introduction. This is going to be fine. I meant no insult. Uh, fortune be with you, and well met. Well met. A sunken sister sat before Ajay and Nimble. A deck of cards unlike those from the mainland laid out before her gently flowing hand. She was old, even for an elf, with eyes deep set in fine line wrinkles and crepe thin skin. She looked up with a gentle smile as she rested her hands atop a downturned card. Do you wish to hear your fortune? That is a big question. I, um... You see, your trade is not something that my people believe in, so will you excuse my skepticism about this? But before I proceed, may I ask, do you know me in some way? I can dismiss you knowing my name because I introduced myself earlier somewhat loudly, but I've been watching you since we got here and you seem to know me even as I came in. I do not know you. But I can see when people are searching for something, there is a familiarity among the lost. That is somehow still unsettling, but okay. Many things about the bulwark are unsettling. That does not mean that they are bad. Can I ask you one last question before you read my fortune? Of course. And it is entirely up to you whether or not you would like your fortune read. I can only offer the willing a glimpse of fate. I cannot force it upon you. If one is to accept this reading of fate, is it destined to come true or is it more a suggestion? What I see, I believe will happen. However, those who draw my cards leave this island And I rarely learn their fates. Well, um, I am here and I think it would be rude of me to not uh, accept local customs, so um, please uh, give me a reading. (laughs) 
<laughs> it's fine to be nervous, Ajay. Most are. Ajay nervously took the seat across from Sister Prina as she collected her cards and shuffled them, slowly but meticulously. They were worn, edges fraying, faces fading. They have a life of their own, just like us all. They age and wear, just like the hands that shuffle them. She placed the cards upon the table. You may make your cut and pull your card. Just one. But first you must pay a due. Not gold or silver. You must tell me... something in a whisper. A secret? A fear? A long-lost desire? If only in name. This stays with me and the fates. I... died once in my past. And while this is common enough knowledge where I am from, and is part of how my bond with my villagers' ancestors has become so strong, I never told anyone that I prayed I would not come back from death. Not because I am ungrateful for the life I have, but because I long to join my ancestors. Though I am afraid that perhaps I have not yet earned my place beside them. Mm. Then we may begin. And so it was that Ajay Ogun, shaman of the Sangoma, speaker for the dead, dared to glimpse fate. Dark Dice, Shores of the Silver Thrum, Chapter 5, The Storyteller and the Pirate. Created by Travis Vengroff and K.A. Stats. Featuring Lily Pichu as Viviana Bloodchamber. Eric Nelson as Vind Graveview. Jasper William Cartwright as Ajay Ogun. Danilo Balascini as Nimble Rumble Trout Spine Trout. Florian Seitler as Yara. Enrique Perez as Convo. Sophie Yang as Lan. Sam Yao as Yuahai. K.A. Stats and Travis Vengroff as Co Dungeon Masters. Featuring the voices of Jack Fallahi, Laura Vilka, Paul Warren, Ned Donovan, and Beth Iyer. This episode was produced and edited with sound design by Travis Vengroff, with dialogue editing assistance by Kayla Shu, mixing and mastering by Dane Leonardson, transcriptions by Shian Francois, and executive producers Dennis Greenhill, Carol Vengroff, AJ Punkin, and Michael Villegas. This episode features music by David Wise, Stephen Malin, Brandon Boone, and Travis Vengroff. To support this production and get ad-free access to bonus releases, music, world lore, art, and early access to future adventures and d materials, please join our Patreon at patreon.com slash foolandscholar. This is a Fool and Scholar production. Thank you for listening.